Well, welcome Dr. Carson. It's wonderful to have you here with LD UK today. Yeah, I thank you uh, to, uh, uh, to get the uh, opportunity uh, for this webinar. I'm very delighted to answer all your interesting questions this afternoon. Oh, thank you. So for those who don't know Dr. Carsten, after finishing his education at two German universities and his medical training, he opened his own GP practice. After only a few weeks, um, he was confronted with the problems of tick-borne diseases, particularly Lyme disease. During 17 years as his career in his career as a GP, these tick-borne diseases started to be of greater and increasing importance to him and his patients. As a result, he decided to found the first German treatment centre, which, which exclusively treats tick-borne diseases. The BCA clinic was established on the 1st of October 2006 and specialises in the diagnostic and treatment of tick-borne diseases and patient rehabilitation. So welcome. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that you've been collaborating um, with the London Lyme Clinic in the treatment of, of Lyme disease patients. So I guess a really good starting place would be how did your interest and expertise in Lyme disease develop? I know we've touched on that slightly in the intro, but I think it'd be good to hear it from your point of view. No, that was more uh, coincidentally. Uh, so in my former career, I was a specialist for transplantation immunology at one of the university hospitals in Munich. And I was responsible for the, uh, uh, for the testings of these patients um, being uh, uh, transplanted. Um, so in, in advance of transplantation and afterwards to optimize the treatment. And uh, we had uh, some, some similar problems uh, as today with uh, Lyme or tick-borne disease patients. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you are very unsure if there is a um, rejection of an organ, um, uh, transplanted organ, or if it's um, uh, worsening based on uh, acute infections, which is sometimes pretty the same in Lyme patient. If you're unsure, it's an onset of autoimmune disease or a chronic infection. Um, but um, uh, for this reason, uh, there was um, at that time also uh, lacking of good testing. So we had only access to the uh, serological testings, um, uh, which um, uh, uh, is always needing minimum uh, two to three weeks to get uh, proper test results. And um, so very soon in Germany, there was a start in different research groups uh, to find out um, uh, better testing uh, to get really immediately um, uh, so uh, best uh, would have been on the same day um, uh, getting a first signs of an, um, uh, worsenings uh, what it is and um, so after um, some time um, a research group in Munich and in Berlin at the Charité um, uh, started offering um, what we today call cellular testing so this was the former generation of the ELI spot or Lyme spot the so-called lymphocytes side uh, transformation testing and based on that and this is uh, by the way gold standard in transplantation medicine so uh, meanwhile we are uh, able so uh, to get um, uh, test results within 24 latest 36 hours uh, to see if there's any onset of acute infection could be a bacterial or viral infection much later so in the second half of the uh, of the 90s so this um, uh, test system uh, was uh, introduced in the field of tick-borne diseases and and uh, um, so uh, based on that background, in the beginning of the 90s, I decided to open my own practice. I wasn't aware at that time uh, about any problem with tick-borne diseases. So I was a well-trained uh, physician. Um, but um, uh, so uh, during a couple of years uh, spending in hospitals, I have only seen a tick, uh, which I had to remove um, uh, uh, when I was on duty. And I have also seen an uh, acute um, a Bell's palsy uh, um, after a tick bite, nothing else so far. And um, so uh, in the first week um, after opening my practice, a patient stepped in telling me that uh, um, uh, he needed uh, support um, uh, based on a former um, uh, infection with Lyme disease. So he had acquired this infection in uh, 1985. And I was the 13th doctor in a row, um, uh, which this guy um, uh, um, attended even to get um, uh, um, uh, sufficient treatment. 
And uh, so, you know, my only basic knowledge was um, uh, to put him for two weeks on doxycycline. And he was not amused uh, when I told him, no, it's not a problem. If you have Lyme, you will get a prescription for two weeks. And um, he was very disappointed. And at that point, I didn't um, understood why. And uh, so, um, so, but in the, uh, uh, in the consultation, I got more and more clarification. So he was really um, uh, uh, frustrated because, uh, again, I was the 13th doctor in a row telling him always the same. And um, so, you know, so, uh, so my believing was um, um, uh, in this um, might be that the patient got the wrong diagnosis, but um, uh, uh, the uh, diagnosis of chronic Lyme was confirmed um, by, uh, by new tests. Things and um, so um, my hope was uh, um, uh, so I, uh, I told this patient so uh, let's go for another testing and let's see us again in around one week and in between uh, my aim was to get some more and sufficient um, information about Lyme disease so I contact my former research center in Munich asking for the newest um, uh, studies or literature but it failed completely there wasn't uh, anything available um, but uh, based on my uh, scientific um, uh, or I did my PhD in immunology and uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, basic research uh, with um, uh, Harvard Medical School in Boston and um, so uh, that was the reason that I con contacted one of my counterparts and uh, this guy told me uh, here there are some crazy guys um, in the Boston area telling people about new approaches of um, uh, uh, for tick-borne diseases or Lyme disease and, and as I saw um, um, uh, what type of approach uh, they are going for and uh, he mentioned yeah extension of uh, the length of treatment as I, um, so what extension and even yeah uh, so um, uh, um, he told me that uh, you have to treat patients who do not respond properly um, minimum for eight to 12 weeks. That was around two to three life cycles of Borrelia. And that was the only suggestion um, 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 uh, I got. Uh, but finally, uh, without having any other plans, uh, we went on this recommendation. And, um, uh, and um, uh, surprisingly, after four weeks, uh, this guy started with first improvements and after eight weeks I would say he was recovered for at least 80 percent and he was very satisfied and uh, it took um, around six or uh, between six and nine months uh, when uh, exactly the same guy showed up again in my practice asking for another round of doxycycline um, uh, because so I had good time six or six good or nine good months and now it's time for another round um, and this was in winter time and um, you know in springtime and in summertime same year I noticed that many patients from my local area uh, came into my practice with the typical um, uh, symptoms of Lyme disease swollen knees painful knees um, uh, uh, fatigue symptoms so all the um, the big bunch of um, uh, symptoms and complaints uh, we know from uh, uh, from the literature or for, from the medical books and from uh, even from this point on it was clear um, that um, uh, I was uh, in an eye endemic area. This was confirmed much later uh, when they started with field studies collecting ticks, looking into the ticks. And um, so, again, uh, so it was coincidentally that I stepped in this field. <laughs> well, it sounds like um, yeah, quite a journey from thinking maybe two weeks doxycycline. But I think the difference perhaps between you and some other doctors is you went to find the answers. Some people think that what they're told in the medical books yeah. that two weeks is or three weeks or four weeks is sufficient. And, and that's that they don't go looking for answers. So, you know, credit to you for doing that. Um, I guess now a good question is, that was what you knew in 1985. How has that changed to now in the in the clinics that you've got now? What treatment do you offer? And does that vary between the, the clinics? You know, um, uh, so uh, over the past 30 years, um, uh, there was a big change um, uh, in diagnosing and in treatment. You know, um, so in the 90s, uh, we had been really only focused on Lyme disease and mm -hmm. nothing else. Um, we had no clue about co-infections or any influences um, about uh, chronic inflammation, uh, immunosuppressant. So, um, uh, so it was quite easy. If someone stepped in uh, with the typical symptoms, we looked for presence of Borrelia and 
and nothing else. And if so, we started antibiotics. So meanwhile, uh, it's much more complicated. We have a lot um, uh, more experience and knowledge. Um, uh, um, so um, Lyme disease or in general tick-borne diseases are very meanwhile very complicated. It's not only um, the presence of a multiple infectious disease at the same time. So, um, so um, uh, having only Lyme disease is really a very rare finding. I would say not even five percent of my patients um, will show up uh, with mono infection with uh, with Borrelia. Uh, um, so most of them um, have um, uh, several other um, new or reactivated infection at the same time. So it could be the real um, co-infection. So we differentiate in our clinic between two uh, groups of co-infection. The real ones are transmitted um, by ticks or other biting or sucking insects. As you know, there are meanwhile some more vectors, could be horse flies, um, even normal mosquitoes um, uh, are able to transmit transmit uh, the, uh, the infection with Lyme disease or um, uh, with one of the other co-infections. And uh, we see also a second group of um, co-infection for us. We, we are telling patients that are secondary infection. Um, uh, it is fact that Borelda is able to downscale the host immune defense. And uh, that opens uh, especially the upper um, respiratory tract um, uh, for airborne transmitted infection. That's the reason that we see a huge bunch of um, uh, bacterial infection like chlamydia pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, and uh, all the uh, different viral infections as there were uh, Epstein-Barr virus, the mononucleosis, um, Coxsackie virus, Cytomegaly virus, the herpes group, Borna virus. Um, so huge bunch of additional infection, um, which are mostly seen at the same time having chronic forms of Lyme disease. It's different in acute stages, but in chronic stages, we are dealing with a bigger bunch of um, other infectious diseases. Sometimes you can also um, see in patient um, a food um, a uh, uh, acquired uh, infection like Yersinia causing reactive arthritis. And uh, this is important to figure out before starting any treatment, the differentials. And, um, you know, um, so I have learned over the past 30 years, um, if you're not going for good um, a diagnostic um, at the beginning, a treatment will very often fail um, uh, because all of these different um, infectious diseases like Lyme, the real co-infection, uh, the secondary infection um, will require different treatment approaches. Um, so you don't have one unique antibiotic which is able uh, to take care for all of these infectious diseases. You mostly need um, a combination of minimum two, sometimes three different antibiotics at the same time. And this is uh, most effective um, if you have uh, done a good job in diagnostic before starting really um, with good um, uh, treatment approaches later on. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. And when when you do that treatment, do you use um, IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics, or do you have um, herbal offerings? How how do you? What are so, your treatment um, choices? So uh, we are very happy that uh, we have access here in Germany to um, all the different uh, um, uh, approaches of um, uh, of treatment. That means uh, we have access to uh, all conventional antimicrobials, means antibiotics, and um, so it could be an oral form, could be an IV form. Um, uh, we have um, uh, more and more um, approaches based on um, uh, so mixed uh, mixed um, uh, treatment protocols means a combination of herbal and conventional antimicrobials at the same time, or if there's any reason, um, finally, based on allergies, uh, intolerances, or other uh, very important reason, we can also offer patients completely alternative uh, treatment protocols. And um, so um, at, the, at the beginning, uh, none of my colleagues, or especially in the first years of the uh, 90s, um, uh, we went all, uh, only on oral treatment. Um, uh, only in very complicated cases means acute uh, stages so dissemination uh, uh, of dissemination means uh, the Bell's palsy for example or paresis of one of the eye um, uh, nerves uh, causing uh, double vision um, um, uh, IV treatment based on uh, ceftriaxin which is the rosefin uh, was indicated um, in all the other cases uh, we went only on oral medication mostly doxycycline but also on beta-lactames 
or cephal oral cephalosporins. Um, so in the second half of the 90s, I had um, um, uh, uh, when I had um, uh, attended my first real Lyme conference, it was in uh, 1996, um, uh, organized by uh, one of the Munich um, uh, universities. Um, that was my first opportunity to meet um, uh, foreign doctors. Uh, there was um, a, a bigger number of American uh, scientists and a physician um, uh, present at that conference in Munich. And um, so um, uh, between all the, uh, the good lectures and presentation, there was a lot of time for discussion. And uh, one of the American doctors um, whom I met at that uh, conference uh, mentioned that um, they have, uh, had no understanding that in Germany for IV treatment at that time, all patients had to be hospitalized. Yeah, uh, There was no chance to get IV treatment uh, in the doctor's practice. And uh, this guy uh, told me uh, he couldn't understand because that was the easiest way to offer IV treatment in a practice uh, without any risk and, um, uh, and big problems. And um, so when I came back from the conference, I discussed with my staff um, and uh, we decided finally a bit later to offer um, a first time IV treatment. And at that time, there was only one um, IV medication available, and that was ceftriaxone. Uh, but it went perfect. And um, so a bit later, we got uh, these first recommendation based on Joe Burroughs um, uh, to go on these pulsing um, uh, uh, with uh, ceftriaxone, not constantly every day, uh, two grams uh, in a row for two or three weeks. So uh, very, uh, Joe Burroughs Kano very early uh, recommended um, uh, to go on a high dose pulse treatment so only on four days but with the double dosage of ceftriaxone and i've always weekend free for three days for recovery and that went perfect and that was easy to handle in the practice that means so from the second half of the 90s um, it was um, for us a um, um, uh, normal approach to offer iv treatment and there are some benefits um, for the patient as well especially for the very sensitive ones uh, having a gastrointestinal issue so um, we have always noticed that the IV treatment uh, was um, uh, faster um, working, so we got a uh, faster response on the treatment, and on the other hand, less uh, gastrointestinal side effects. And so if even possible, um, we would always prefer, especially in the first two or three weeks, it depends um, on the protocol to start with IV treatment. And at a later point, in most of the cases, we will, uh, we will change on orals. But this gives us a better chance um, uh, uh, to see um, how the patient will respond on the different um, uh, uh, phases of the um, antibiotic trials. So if there's good tolerance, uh, are, are there onset of any side effects, um, you can um, uh, uh, react much earlier on so-called Herxheimer reactions. And um, I'm, uh, with other words, a big fan. If there's any chance to start with IV um, a treatment, I would uh, definitely prefer um, uh, uh, versus oral treatment. Okay, so you would, um, whatever oral protocol that the, the patient was due to go on to, you would start, you would prefer rather to start with issue, um, administering those same antibiotics IV to check reactions to all of them before the patient then moved on to orals at home. And, you know, sometimes there's another reason, and um, maybe it's um, also good to discuss today. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, we notice more and more patients with GI problems before starting any treatment. So um, in the past, our believing was mostly that um, if there was any onset of uh, GI problems, um, so uh, let's say like diarrhea, abdominal cramps, uh, over bloating, um, uh, uh, stomach pain, um, um, uh, or believing was for a long time, it could be only seen as a side effects on antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, we have really to differentiate. There are a lot of health conditions uh, seen at the same time uh, without any negative influence of the antibiotics. So meanwhile, um, uh, we, ha we have always seen these IBS-like um, uh, health condition. Um, uh, meanwhile, patients show up uh, very often with SIBO syndrome, with leaky gut syndrome, uh, with fungal um, uh, um, uh, super infections. And um, uh, so this is one of the reasons um, that you are um, on a much safer side starting with IV treatment. Uh, you can spare the GI tract for a certain time and oral medication can cause 
uh, dramatically worsenings of the um, uh, GI um, uh, conditions. Yeah, and, um, and especially if, if a patient is suffering from a SIBO syndrome or leaky gut, uh, we have also noticed a big problem with absorption in the small intestine. Um, uh, yeah, that means um, so theoretically there should be no difference between the IV treatment and the oral treatment. Um, so especially in long-term treatment, after a couple of days, uh, you should reach um, a, a good trough levels, means um, good concentration in all the different tissues. Uh, but unfortunately, in a certain percentage of patients, um, the uh, orals will fail. There is some response, but not full response. That means these patients seem to be not able to build up sufficient um, the trough level. It means in well-flooded organ system, you will uh, notice good response and uh, uh, improvement of um, uh, the local symptoms. But um, if we are dealing with um, uh, really a bad flooded um, uh, 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 tissues um, in, uh, in the organism, it could lead really to non-response and bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. I see. You've spoken quite a lot about um, testing. Would you, how do you go about making a diagnosis? What, what testing do you recommend and, and yep. do you use clinical diagnosis? Um, you know, um, this is a very good question and because one of the obstacles. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of our today's talk um, that uh, diagnostic is really the basement for good treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, as we all know, um, there are some problems um, uh, on one hand to get access to good um, uh, diagnostic. On the other hand, uh, we have um, uh, big problems uh, with accurate testing. So um, the two-tier testing um, which is uh, the basic uh, testing in all European countries or worldwide in the countries dealing with Lyme disease. So based on an ELISA test um, um, uh, 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 to have a first look and in uh, biological um, uh, results, uh, then followed by an um, immuno or Western blot. Um, this is, um, so in, uh, according to the guidelines, the gold standard. Uh, but the problem starts with the quality or sensitivity of the ELISA testing. Unfortunately, on average, um, we have a sensitivity from, uh, um, of about 50%. Some, uh, so some testings are a bit more sensitivity, others less. So, um, so the range is between 30 uh, and 70% um, uh, sensitivity. That means on average, every second patient will fail in the first uh, testings. Um, so they will get uh, false negative results and the doctor will tell them, so um, your uh, symptom complaints are not um, related or connected uh, to Lyme disease. And um, this is really uh, a big issue. So if we would um, uh, stop with ELISA testing only using the Western blot, um, which have an uh, accuracy or sensitivity between 85 and 95%, uh, um, uh, you will have definitely less numbers of um, uh, false negative uh, testing, which uh, would be much better for the patients. Um, um, uh, but the serological testing is only one part of the diagnostic. So we have learned that um, uh, um, um, the serological testing is only focused on the uh, production of antibodies. So um, after getting antigen um, contact, um, our body is producing um, antibodies and uh, these uh, uh, in the serological testing we are looking uh, for the potential presence of, um, of these antibodies, um, uh, which could also fail. Um, a good uh, diagnostic includes also the, the other part of the immune system, the cellular immune defense. And uh, beginning um, of the 19th, so this is uh, uh, based on my uh, background uh, from transplant, um, uh, tr uh, transplantation immunology, uh, we have learned that the cellular testing um, uh, could um, give up much faster and sometimes with much higher sensitivity um, uh, a good outcome, that means good diagnostics. So um, uh, to see if there's something going on uh, with Borrelia or any of the other uh, tick-borne diseases. And um, so our approach is uh, basically um, uh, to, to run all these uh, available testings at the same time. So the standard serological testings, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, not doing any uh, um, very often the ELISA test, um, but I'm always include a, a good Western blot um, test kit 
uh, additionally, um, the, um, the, the ELI spot or LIME spot technique, so means uh, to get the information from the cellular immune uh, defense. And um, there's another test system available called CD57 cell test, which was originally developed uh, mid of the 90s um, in the US um, as a good monitoring parameter uh, for chronicity of these tick-borne diseases. For a long time, our believing was that CD57 was very specific only for Borrelia. Um, and, um, but meanwhile, uh, we have evidence based on uh, new data that the CD57 are more seen as a specific uh, chronicity parameter for tick-borne diseases. Um, uh, we had always noticed that other um, uh, co-infections have influenced um, the, uh, the CD57 cells. It was obvious um, since a long time that chlamydia pneumonia, for example, or mycoplasma pneumonia had also some impact. Um, but new, um, uh, pre uh, um, uh, um, uh, new publication from Dr. Jotsna Shaw from California um, had shown that uh, it's more seen as a general parameter for chronicity of tick-borne diseases. It will also include um, a Bartonella and Barbesia. Um, so, and this is very helpful and supportive um, for doctors as well as for patients to see where they are. Okay. And earlier you mentioned, I think you mentioned, so correct me if I'm wrong, um, some element of testing that was able to try and distinguish between whether um, uh, there was an active infection or, or active inflammation that was more of an issue. What, what test is that? Yeah, um, this is um, the new generation of ELI spots. So we have introduced um, around three years ago um, uh, this new uh, test type. Um, means um, that we are actually not only measuring uh, the interferon gamma production, which is representing the infectious acti um, disease activity. Um, uh, so we have started five years ago uh, with first trials uh, to get um, uh, at the same time information about um, a local or general inflammation. You know, this was always um, a part of the criticism of uh, the ELI spots. Um, so um, uh, uh, doctors and scientists um, uh, mentioned that um, we can't uh, see, uh, uh, be focused on the on the on the interleukin two uh, on the interferon gamma production uh, because um, uh, these cells um, uh, could um, also um, uh, cause local or general inflammation. And um, so, um, um, you know, this is part of the problem. So if someone is chronic infected, he will automatically show up at the same time with local and general inflammation um, and immunosuppressor. And all of these um, uh, health conditions could have been Sorry to stop you for one second. We've just, the sound's just gone a little bit funny. Oh, so uh, from my side, the line is pretty good. Ah, you're okay now. I just lost lost that section. Yeah. So do you mind just going back over the, that tiny little part? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, the old fashioned ELI spot or the former lymphocyte transformation testing uh, gave only information about um, the um, activity of the infectious diseases. But the, um, um, the other um, uh, problems based on local or general inflammation were not, uh, was not represented by the normal ELI spot. So our aim was to int uh, introduce as soon as as possible um, a reliable testing um, uh, to get at the same time information about local and general um, inflammation. And we did a lot of research uh, uh, checking all the different cytokines um, uh, to find out um, um, uh, easy to handle uh, testing, um, which is also payable for patients in a sense uh, not to overload them uh, with extended costs. Um, and uh, anti uh, so an inflammation panel is mostly um, in most of the lab somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds, wow. which is quite a lot. And um, our aim was to find um, um, uh, a cheap way um, uh, to get uh, these needed information about inflammation. 
And so we did um, uh, trials with different interleukins um, uh, to find out which is the best of all the known interleukins to get um, really this miss uh, uh, or missing information about um, uh, inflammation. Finally, we decided um, a couple of years ago for the interleukin 2. Um, so, and uh, meanwhile, um, looking in one testing for both the interleukin 2 production and the interferon gamma production of T lymphocytes, we will exactly get this information, or we, uh, we have been able to close the gap uh, be, um, uh, to differentiate between um, uh, inflammation and, infect uh, and the infection. And um, uh, so um, it's, uh, it's an easy to handle test here in the lab. It's a very reliable testing. And uh, we are getting um, exactly after later 36 hours, the needed information. And uh, we have learned um, uh, to, uh, to handle these testings meanwhile very best. So uh, for example, at the beginning, before starting any treatment, um, uh, you see mostly uh, some infectious disease activity and less inflammatory activity. And uh, if you start treatment, um, our aim is to kill as best as possible uh, the cells. Um, and if we, are, um, uh, uh, um, if we are able to do so, uh, we have a lot of bacterial trash um, in local areas. And the trash is causing um, acute local inflammation. Automatically, you will see higher uh, production of interleukin-2 for an intermediate time. Yeah, that means in the same testings uh, a couple of weeks later, so you see mostly less uh, production of uh, interferon gamma representing the in uh, infectious disease activity and a higher amount um, of interleukin-2 representing more onset of inflammation. But um, uh, after successful treatment, um, our aim is to get um, uh, uh, to see no more activity. So it means no activity based on the uh, infection and on the inflammation. And by introducing um, um, these tests, which we call the Lyme test, um, we have really much better and more accurate information about um, these uh, conditions. Okay, so if the Lyme test came back that somebody's in, uh, their infection levels were very, very high, that you, you would progress with a, an antimicrobial treatment, but if they were very, very high on the um, inflammation side, you would start with some kind of inflammatory treatment? What, how would you go about um, reducing exactly. the inflammation? Um, this is exactly what it is. Uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, we see more um, uh, infectious disease activity that requires um, the use of antimicrobials, whatever it is, conventional ones or alternative means verbal ones. Um, in, uh, intermediately, uh, uh, um, uh, there might be the need for both. Additionally, on top, some anti-inflammatory stuff to downscale the local or general inflammation. And uh, sometimes uh, we see in, in, in patients that there's no more uh, activity based on the former infectious diseases, but still some problem with uh, inflammation, then the treatment, uh, rec uh, the recommendation completely different from um, in these patients or those patients, you don't need any more antimicrobials, you need only anti-inflammatory um, uh, medication. I see. I understand. Thank you. And, uh, and you know, and um, so uh, inflammation and infection could uh, cause for a certain time, same symptoms and complaints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an overlapping problem. And um, um, so, so it could happen that someone is really um, best and sufficient uh, treated for the infections, but uh, still showing up with some or with same or similar symptoms and complaints. Um, but then there's uh, no more need to go back on antimicrobials. Uh, you can put these patients only on anti-inflammatory medication. I see. I understand. And if we're going back to talking about the antimicrobials, you said at the beginning you used, um, in the early days of your practice, you used doxycycline a lot. Do you still use that for late stage treatment or do you agree with some of the other um, Lyme experts that it can push the spirochetes into cis form and other antibiotics are more appropriate? You know, uh, we have learned um, so running our own you can hear me very well. There are yes. some noises in the background. 
Okay, but uh, just to give you a short explanation, um, if we do in vitro testing, that means in Borrelia culture, if you put something in the culture, could be salty solution, could be any type of antibiotics, uh, we will stress uh, the original spiral feeds and they will start immediately um, changing their surface. So, uh, you know, uh, we have for an intermediate time um, uh, other polymorphic forms called BLEPs or mm -hmm. the round body former cystic forms. And um, if you uh, wait for a couple of hours, you will also see these what we call biofilm formations. Meanwhile, um, the different polymorphic forms had been approved um, in vivo as well, done uh, by Professor Sharpie in New Haven, uh, by other researchers in, um, in Norway for Bartonella, for example, for Borrelia, it's well proven. And, uh, and this is exactly uh, what could happen. So uh, there are some antibiotics um, which um, uh, could be seen as a stressor for these bacteria, and they will uh, start immediately to protect themselves uh, in changing um, their shapes into a, um, a different shape. Yeah? And the round body uh, means that your own immune system is not anymore able to, um, uh, to um, uh, detect a round body or cystic form as being an enemy. It's a friend. Because on the surface of the round body or cyst, uh, you will find completely different information compared to the original spirochete. Yeah, it's a masquerade in some time, in some type. And unfortunately, um, doxycycline alone uh, or any antibiotic uh, can provoke um, these polymorphic forms. Um, that does not automatically mean that doxycycline is a bad antibiotic and uh, shouldn't be uh, taken anymore. Um, but uh, for a chronic health condition, means chronic infection, um, um, I guess it's fatal to go on mono treatment, means um, to use only one antibiotic. You should always decide for a minimum of a combination of two antibiotics or um, uh, more and more often three antibiotics at the same time, um, um, even to get access to all the different uh, shapes and uh, polymorphic forms of these bacteria. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that makes sense. You mentioned Bartonella then, so I think it's a good opportunity to ask you, how do you go about treating the primary and the secondary co-infections? So I have to admit, so Bartonella is one of the biggest challenges actually in our practice. Yeah? Uh, that is uh, what we had to learn over the past 10 years. Um, so um, the, uh, the tradition taking care for Bartonella um, um, uh, was was much um, later than in the US. Um, uh, so the guys, our colleagues in the US, uh, started 10 years before the European colleagues um, uh, start taking care for Bartonella. And Bartonella, again, is a very tricky bacterium, um, which is mostly hidden um, in the red blood cells. And this is also a big difference um, uh, to Borrelia. Borrelia could be found in any other uh, body cells and um, Bartonella specifically most of the time in the red blood cells. Um, uh, so once a month, um, uh, uh, all of these bacteria uh, wants to replicate and therefore they have to come out into the extracellular space, mostly uh, the intra uh, um, uh, basal um, uh, space. Um, uh, for this procedure. And um, this is mostly uh, this, uh, exactly the point uh, where patients notice the flare-ups or worsenings of their um, symptoms and complaints. Um, so sometimes you can find Bartonella also in, um, in the lymph system, especially in the lymph nodes. And uh, based on uh, new publications, um, um, we are aware of specific Bartonella rashes. And uh, meanwhile, it's best approved um, that um, uh, if you go on biopsies of um, these Bartonella rashes, you have really good chances um, to detect uh, the uh, DNA of Bartonella, or it is also possible to culture Bartonella directly from the biopsies. Um, and uh, uh, so what is the best treatment? Um, so um, uh, from uh, my perspective, the best treatment for Bartonella is, uh, or the gold standard, is a combination based on macrolids. My favorite is acetromycin. Um, in combination with one of the old-fashioned tuberculostatics called rifampicin. So um, this is definitely um, uh, uh, one of the uh, best approaches to start with, um, with the uh, uh, highest chances of eradication. Um, if that, uh, uh, if that, 
is not sufficient enough and that um, sometimes you see patients who, uh, who started to improve but only on a certain level, not full improvement, then it is worth to combine um, additionally a third antibiotic and um, uh, uh, this would for, uh, be for me uh, the use of minocycline. Mm -hmm. one of the tetracyclines mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess I'm in full agreement so for me the leading um, Bartonella expert um, is Dr. Bob Mosayeni from Bethesda, Maryland so here yeah, together with Professor Brightsford they have uh, done the most publication on the topic of Bartonella and, um, uh, and Bob uh, Mosayeni is really um, uh, for me, the leading expert, and um, this is exactly um, what he is recommending his patients. So, a macrolid, the rifampicin, and um, if needed, additionally one of the tetracyclines. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the use of rifampicin could really lead to big problems, side effects um, 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 of the um, uh, function of the thyroid gland. Um, so, with increasing uh, TSH levels. Um, so uh, this would be a limitation of using uh, rifampicin. Alternatively, um, uh, we are um, uh, replacing then the rifampicin um, with a substance called trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. Um, but uh, the other approaches um, um, have shown not uh, the same good response as uh, the both mentioned one. Mm -hmm. I see. And do you find any patients that don't have the Borrelia infection, but they do have other tick-borne diseases. This is, by the way, a very rarely finding. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say not even 5%. Um, mm -hmm. So we have double-checked our data um, uh, um, six months ago, um, uh, really to find out um, how uh, big the percentage uh, was, and it was not even 5%. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, the overall majority of patients will show up uh, with a bunch of um, uh, Borrelia and different co-infections. Mm -hmm. So maybe, um, I think you said less than 5% only have Borrelia, and less than 5% don't have, no, but have uh, other uh, co-infections. 5% uh, will show up only with Borrelia. Yeah. Um, um, so mostly you see uh, many other co-infections beside Borrelia, mm -hmm. uh, but it could happen that patient um, uh, can show up only with co-infection, yeah. without Borrelia. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. possible. But you're well, looking at probably... Um, is, uh, again, Bartonella, sometimes um, Anaplasma, Alicia, a rickettsial infection. Um, so, you know, there, uh, there's um, different um, uh, uh, onset in the different areas of Europe. So in the north, you have uh, specifically different co-infection that in the southern parts of Europe uh, uh, means um, Italy, south of Spain. Uh, there are big difference in the patterns of co-infection. Mm -hmm. And so 80 plus percent of patients that you see you have Lyme plus co-infections. Yeah, yeah, more than 90%, definitely. Yeah. Uh, 90% plus, sorry, yes, that's my maths being very poor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I guess it's a, a one good question is, do you believe that um, these pathogens can be completely eliminated from someone's body? Or is it a case that we just get the, back, the, low, the pathogenic load down to a certain level and the person is able to live a, a normal life without... Um, completely eradicating them? I guess um, uh, this is exactly what it is. So uh, my personal believing is um, that we, um, uh, if we are doing a good job, that means uh, based on good diagnostic, uh, based on even better um, uh, treatment, uh, there's a good chance of eradication um, of the bugs. But unfortunately, um, until so far, there's no test system available um, which um, is giving you a 100% chance of 100% eradication. So uh, uh, what means um, uh, heal uh, a patient or uh, fully improve patients? I guess um, uh, so. Um, um, a good definition could be that these patients uh, will show up with no more symptoms and complaints after successful treatment. And not only for a couple of weeks or months, um, that should be constantly seen later on. And uh, my belief in it that this is possible, but nobody could um, uh, give you a guarantee that there are um, uh, not still somewhere um, some hidden Bartonella, Borrelia, whatever it is. Um, but um, uh, so, you know, our, um, our goal is always, um, uh, uh, so, and this is represented by the big three eyes, 
um, uh, the first eye representing the infection, so to eradicate as best as possible the invaders, um, to downscale as best as possible any forms of local or general inflammation, and um, a third, to enhance uh, the immune function. That means um, uh, to get um, a very stable um, um, and proper working immune function. And I guess uh, this is finally uh, later on the reason if patient um, um, uh, uh, don't show up uh, with any symptoms and complaints. If we uh, fulfill all the three mentioned requirements, um, I guess a uh, patient has really good chance uh, for good life quality later on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. How, how would you go about treating a very sensitive patient, um, late stage Lyme? Uh, we had a couple of people ask this question and we're killing with whether it be with um, pharmaceutical antimicrobials or herbal antimicrobials causes uh, autoimmune or mast cell flares um, but they've also like you say got this level of immune suppression what, what yeah. would you do with a very sensitive patient that can't tolerate treatment um, uh, yeah uh, let's um, um, uh, admit uh, at first uh, another very important comment so we see uh, those patients on a daily basis, and uh, what we have learned uh, most of these patients who had failed on many, many trials on masses of antibiotics, sometimes herbal um, um, uh, antimicrobials, never got sufficient uh, combination of antibiotics. Yeah, and uh, this is very often the reason. So um, they took um, uh, uh, antibiotics for ages sometimes, yeah, uh, but um, in not sufficient combinations. Um, but uh, let's uh, uh, going back to your question. Uh, if someone is not anymore tolerating any uh, conventional antibiotics or even the herbal ones, um, uh, then uh, the only chance is uh, to get um, some improvement is really based on um, uh, 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 general immune support um, uh, uh, together with some uh, lifestyle changes to go on a good and healthy diet and a good stress management. Mm -hmm. So um, this is not a causative um, uh, treatment, it's more a symptomatically treatment, but could also lead to some improvements. And uh, then uh, at a later stage, uh, when these patients are in a, uh, in a better condition or better shape again, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to think about another approach, but, but then on a, on a really sufficient approach. And again, this is one of the biggest um, uh, problems I have mostly seen patients who have been treated uh, for a long time with many different treatment approaches, um, but uh, colleagues before have used antibiotics who never had been able um, uh, to target or to eradicate these specific um, uh, confirmed infectious diseases. Uh, very often we see insufficient treatment regarding Bartonella and Babesia. Um, so uh, colleagues um, are going for standard protocols which might um, uh, show up with good effects uh, for a normal Borrelia infection, yeah? you know, um, uh, chronic Lyme, for example. Um, but um, uh, the medication, which which could um, be very supportive and beneficial for Lyme, does not automatically um, show up with good effectiveness uh, regarding uh, these, we call that specific intracellular bugs uh, like uh, Babesia and Bartonella. And uh, this is most of the uh, uh, challenges. I understand, I understand. We've spoken quite a lot about um, antimicrobial treatment and herbal treatment, whether that's pharmaceutical or herbal. How about other approaches? What are your views on, say, stem cell therapy? So uh, at this point, uh, you know, um, there are a lot of other um, offers for uh, different uh, treatment approaches. One of them is stem cell treatment. So actually, um, uh, we have also, uh, so I've seen uh, a couple of patients who got stem cells in the past. Um, I have seen not only one patient who really sufficiently responded very well. Uh, so recently, um, I had a young patient, uh, age 16, from the US, uh, who got stem cell treatment and uh, was much worse uh, after getting the stem cells. And 
Um, so after um, uh, some waiting time, uh, we started again um, uh, in um, uh, early summer with um, antibiotics, and now he's really in a good um, uh, good shape and condition uh, with much improvement. But there was no response. On the other hand, I'm aware of um, uh, uh, case reports uh, where patients um, have uh, seen really a very good outcome, and um, uh, it was exactly the opposite uh, non-response on antimicrobial and. Uh, with the stem cells treatment, the first signs of improvement and good improvement. I guess it's too early. It's a very young fashion um, uh, uh, type of treatment, and uh, we know uh, uh, we, we will need a lot more experience and in some kind of standardization. You know, there in several countries, there are um, offers and options to go for stem cell treatment. But why, what I have learned, most of the uh, 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 centers are using different techniques. And uh, so um, it's pretty hard to compare uh, the different uh, treatment approaches to each other. Um, it is in some kind stem cell treatment, but in different ways. Yeah, and uh, we need um, we need uh, some standards and we need good studies, um, uh, even uh, to compare the outcome um, 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 of these uh, types of treatment. It's similar to other approaches uh, like uh, the plasma pheresis, for example. You know, um, um, uh, so it's it's similar to the um, uh, dialysis. Um, so the aim is, or, or, uh, or the guys offering these services, um, telling people that they are able to wash out the bacteria um, out of the bloodstream. Um, uh, so I, to I personally don't believe in plasma pheresis. It's really a good approach um, uh, to um, to get a lower burden of um, of um, uh, the inflammatory or inflammation, so it's possible to wash out cytokines, and this is the reason that patients feel much better after getting plasma phoresis. But I don't believe um, in the uh, in the fact that plasma phoresis is able uh, to wash out uh, the bacteria out of the bloodstream. Uh, you know, uh, especially under um, a condition that uh, most of the tick-borne diseases are intracellular layer bugs and uh, will be present most of the time in the intracellular layer space. Um, so uh, for me, uh, it's not um, um, uh, at, at that point not a recommendable approach for the infectious diseases. It's pretty good if someone has big problem with inflammation, um, then it could be very beneficial, but not regarding infectious diseases. I see that makes sense I understand and I guess that's where depending on what your clients or patients test you would potentially if it was a large inflammation load exactly, um, exactly. you know it's, it's really possible to wash out the cytokines and um, this give, uh, this is giving patient um, uh, much much relief uh, so especially for the pain levels um, for uh, the local swelling of the joints yeah so they feel for at least one week much much better but um, so there's a need for additionally um, uh, treatments and uh, plasma phoresis is very expensive somewhere between three thousand and five thousand um, uh, uh, pounds uh, per treatment and you know um, so uh, and my believing is you won't have any chances of getting rid of the infection. Mm -hmm. So um, after a certain time, it's wasting of money, mm -hmm. but it's not an appropriate approach. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. this is my uh, my personal opinion. No, sure. no, I can understand that's a lot of money just for some symptom relief and no long term outcome. Now I can I can see that. Yeah. Can we move away from the the chronic line for a moment to to acute cases? So we have a lot of patients, um, and sadly there's been a large number this year. Uh, I think in some ways it's good. The awareness, people are coming and finding us and are able to get um, more information about, to take to their doctors to get more appropriate treatment. But if you were infected tomorrow, um, what, would, what would you do personally for, a, for an acute case? So, you know, in acute uh, cases, um, so it's very important um, to remove as fast as possible the tick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and this is number one. Number second, um, so it depends. So normally, um, if there are some safe clinical signs, mean first onset of an erythema migrant, the bull's eye rash, you can start immediately with antibiotics. Unfortunately, as we know, only in around 50%, you will see the erythema migrant. 
Um, so in those cases, uh, my recommendation is to wait at least um, a two to maximum two and a half week and then to go on uh, some blood tests, um, uh, even to figure out if there was transmission or not. Um, uh, 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 also important, uh, if you would notice um, uh, shortly after a tick attachment or a tick bite onset of flu-like um, uh, infection, I guess even in those cases, I would also start with antibiotics without uh, waiting on a proper uh, uh, testing. Um, so um, our recommendation is uh, to go minimum on 20 days. Um, we have seen some cases of acute treatment um, with two weeks or less than two weeks. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of doctors uh, who are recom uh, recommending only five or seven days treatment. This is definitely not sufficient enough. Um, so uh, we try everything to convince our patient to stay for a minimum 20 days uh, because there's some good evidence in the literature uh, that the risk um, of uh, chronic uh, development of chronic stage is very, very low. Uh, um, after uh, such type of treatment. And um, so um, if, um, again, if someone is uh, tested and if the testing uh, came up positive, uh, we would immediately start with the same treatment. Um, and um, uh, maybe um, uh, uh, it will be interesting um, uh, for you. Um, we are not um, big friends of doxycycline, um, so due to two reasons. So doxycycline is a substance which can eradicate later on the immune or host immune response. That means uh, it's obvious that um, after being treated with doxycycline, um, the uh, um, uh, serological testing could fail later on. Um, um, uh, this is one of the reasons. The other reason um, is, uh, especially here in Germany, um, uh, there had been a lot of reports based on epidemiological data that uh, up to 70% of the elder uh, population is resistant against uh, doxycycline. Um, so from my perspective, uh, to uh, promote uh, antibiotic, uh, which is uh, well known for resistance, can't be um, the gold standard uh, for the treatment of, um, of uh, this um, uh, um, a serious uh, a type of infectious diseases. And um, we have learned that um, other antibiotics, so in young um, uh, children, for example, based on beta lactams like penicillin and amoxicillin, is doing really a very good job in acute stages. Um, the oral forms of cephalosporins um, are uh, really also fully recommendable. Um, but my personal favorite uh, is mostly based on the macrolids, so like glutamycin and uh, acetromycin, uh, because we have seen really less side effects and a very good response. And um, it's well known that especially the macrolids um, uh, are setting up very soon uh, sufficient trough levels in all the different tissues. And uh, this is um, um, uh, very important to get really good outcome, uh, even acute stages of Lyme disease. Thank you. No, that's really useful. Thank you for going through that. Um, I guess it, it links probably to a lot of what we've been discussing, but uh, do you ever think, or, or how do you think, we could get to the stage where mainstream doctors accept the seriousness of Lyme disease and they take the acute cases seriously and they treat appropriately but equally for those people that either weren't treated initially were under treated failed treatment they accept that it can have quite serious consequences and people can end up very very poorly yeah and this is very a very important point um, uh, you have mentioned um, um, the problem is that most of the doctors in Germany, I guess it's pretty the same in UK or in any other uh, European country, they will be trained um, uh, during their medical um, uh, training mm -hmm. uh, that Lyme disease um, is not a very serious disease. Mm -hmm. It's easy to diagnose and even easier to treat. And um, this is definitely uh, not the fact. Um, so uh, otherwise we won't have uh, so many people suffering from chronic stages and there was um, recently published data new data here in Germany um, so um, uh, from a completely independent group and uh, it is suggested that even in Germany um, they uh, suggest minimum 500,000 up to
to 1 million uh, people in Germany suffering from chronic Lyme. And officially, um, uh, we, will, uh, we will get presentation of completely different numbers every year, uh, beginning of the season, and, and that is not true. Um, so I guess there is big, big need um, uh, to really to, um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to do our best to train uh, better uh, doctors, especially the uh, GPs um, in, the, in the area, especially in the high endemic area. And uh, um, uh, you, um, in your introduction, you have mentioned that I was uh, one of the board directors of ILETS for at least eight years. And um, so I was responsible um, for the uh, physician trainee programs. Um, so uh, there's a chance if someone is interested in the field of tick-borne diseases um, uh, to apply uh, for a trainee program up to two weeks um, in practices or um, uh, uh, hospitals um, who are specialized on, uh, uh, on tick-borne diseases to be trained better. And um, so um, we have done our contribution for that. Um, only here in Augsburg, um, uh, over the past 10 years, we have trained more than 1,200 doctors from many different different parts of the world um, uh, to diagnose and to treat better. Um, so last weekend, um, I was um, on a, a health fair here in our area uh, the whole weekend, um, even to spread um, the information um, about um, the um, uh, uh, tick-borne diseases. Um, um, and uh, so we are always inviting doctors uh, to join us or um, uh, to be better trained. I guess there's a, there's a worldwide need for that. Mm -hmm. um, so the World uh, Health Organization um, uh, is estimating that there are around 40 million people worldwide uh, suffering from Lyme disease. And so as long as there's a, not a complete change in mind, um, how how serious tick-borne diseases could be, I guess um, uh, we 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 don't uh, we won't have any uh, solution for the problem. Mm. Mm. And uh, therefore, I appreciate uh, your activities, and um, I guess uh, we are aligned um, uh, in our approaches um, uh, to spread um, these informations and um, uh, uh, to keep uh, the awareness regarding tick-borne diseases as high as possible. And there's uh, still um, a very big need for that. Absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't have so many people in our group if chronic Lyme disease didn't exist. Uh, it's as simple yeah, as that. Exactly. Um, so we we asked our members for questions and we've we've been through quite a lot of them and there was one more question that was quite specific. Um, so it, it, the the question is is Lyme related to endocarditis or splinter hemorrhages? Yeah. Um, so some of the tick-borne diseases can uh, definitely cause some very specific cardiac issues. Mm -hmm. um, endocarditis is one of them. Myocarditis is seen. Uh, then um, very severe heart rhythm disturbances. Um, that could be based on a Borrelia. Um, Borrelia can, um, uh, uh, can be found in all the different uh, tissues of the heart. Um, that is what we have noticed in some patients who got um, catheter uh, examination um, uh, with uh, some biopsies. And um, uh, so um, uh, the, the biopsies had been taken to confirm viruses um, uh, from different um, uh, uh, um, uh, areas of the heart. But finally, it came up that in all uh, biopsies, they have found Borrelia. Uh, so it's um, uh, sometimes a very widespread problem um, in this uh, specific um, uh, organ system. And um, uh, uh, Borrelia can also cause um, some uh, problems um, 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 uh, in the blood. Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, uh, typically seen, uh, we are seen, uh, have seen the same uh, for Babesia infection and Bartonella. So, um, uh, just to give you an example, Bartonella is seen as a small vessel disease that could uh, lead to uh, severe problems um, in the intravascular uh, space. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. You're welcome. I'm very conscious of the time and I know, I know you're busy. So, but if I could just ask one last question that we do try and ask all of our, yeah, sure. our experts, sure. what would you say to a patient who feels that there's no way out? Sorry, could you read that? The line was pretty bad. Actually. Oh, I, I apologize. I said, what, what would you say to a patient that feels there's no way out? They're desperate and they, they feel there's no way no, out. Um, so, so um, I have seen uh, plenty of these patients, and um, so um, my believing is that there's always a way out. 
Yeah, um, and uh, so that is what I have learned. I have seen a patient who had been told, um, so um, uh, there's no chance of treatment for you. Um, you have to accept your illness um, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, in, uh, in really most of the cases, it wasn't true. Um, so uh, there's only, there's a very small uh, group of patients who had some um, uh, um, problems on their genes. So we are aware of specific types of HLA-DR subtypes um, who will respond not in a proper way on conventional antimicrobials. Yeah, um, and that could be tested. It's a routine genetic um, uh, testing, uh, uh, testing available here in Europe in any uh, routine lab. Um, even in those patients uh, who uh, theoretically uh, won't respond on antimicrobials, you can find uh, good approaches, um, for example, on alternative protocol, finally to get improvement. And then uh, the numbers of the patient who never have responded on treatment is really very, very rare. I guess there's always hope. And, uh, you know, uh, my proposal is, um, so if someone um, has run a lot of treatment or was has consulted a lot of different doctors, uh, then um, uh, look for another one, um, ask for a second, third or fourth opinion. Um, mostly there's a chance. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. And we just really appreciate you, you giving up um, this slot in your diary. No, thank you. It was a uh, pleasure for me as well um, uh, to support um, Lyme disease uh, UK. And um, as you know, um, I have seen so many patients uh, from England and other parts of UK. And uh, I'm aware that this is a widespread problem in uh, most of the parts of um, of UK and uh, finally underestimated. And I would really appreciate um, if um, uh, we can, um, of course, a change of uh, um, in mind uh, really to take uh, these types of uh, infectious diseases more serious and uh, to get more patient in um, in really in good treatment. I couldn't agree and, more. Um, that's my hope for the future. And um, if there's any chance to support um, uh, you um, uh, in that task, I would be happy. Thank you so much. Well, we'll close it there, but thank you for your time. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a great afternoon and uh, see you hopefully soon in person. Absolutely. You Bye. too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.